Lesson 12 Rewards of Faithfulness Sabbath Afternoon March 18 Do all church members realize that all they have is given them to be used and improved to God's glory? God keeps a faithful account with every human being in our world. And when the day of reckoning comes, the faithful steward takes no credit to himself. He does not say, my pound, but thy pound hath gained other pounds. He knows that without the entrusted gift, no increase could have been made. He feels that in faithfully discharging his stewardship, he has but done his duty. The capital was the Lord's, and by his power he was enabled to trade upon it successfully. His name only should be glorified. Without the entrusted capital, he knows that he would have been bankrupt for eternity. The approval of the Lord is received almost with surprise. It is so unexpected. But Christ says to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Councils on Stewardship, pages 111 and 112. Fellow Pilgrim, we are still amid the shadows and turmoil of earthly activities, but soon our Savior is to appear to bring deliverance and rest. Let us by faith behold the blessed hereafter as pictured by the hand of God. He who died for the sins of the world is opening wide the gates of paradise to all who believe on him. Soon the battle will have been fought, the victory won. Soon we shall see him in whom our hopes of eternal life are centered. And in his presence, the trials and sufferings of this life will seem as nothingness. The former things shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that, after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come, will come, and will not tarry. Israel shall be saved with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed, nor confounded, world without end. Isaiah chapter 65, verse 17, Hebrews chapter 10, verses 35 to 37, and Isaiah chapter 45, verse 17. Prophets and Kings, page 731. Your faith in Jesus will give strength to every purpose, consistency to the character. All your happiness, peace, joy, and success in this life are dependent upon genuine, trusting faith in God. This faith will prompt true obedience to the commandments of God. Your knowledge and faith in God is the strongest restraint from every evil practice and the motive to all good. Believe in Jesus as one who pardons your sins, one who wants you to be happy in the mansions he has gone to prepare for you. He wants you to live in his presence, to have eternal life and a crown of glory. In keeping God's commandments, there is great reward, even in this life. Our conscience does not condemn us. Our hearts are not at enmity with God, but at peace with him. Sons and Daughters of God, page 45. Sunday, March 19. Reward for Faithfulness. There is no encouragement given for unbelief. The Lord manifests His grace and His power over and over again, and this should teach us that it is always profitable under all circumstances to cherish faith, to talk faith, to act faith. We are not to have our hearts and hands weakened by allowing the suggestions of suspicious minds to plant in our hearts the seeds of doubt and distrust. The Lord works in cooperation with the will and action of the human agent. It is the privilege and duty of every man to take God at His word, to believe in Jesus as His personal Savior, and to respond eagerly, immediately, to the gracious propositions which He makes. He is to study to believe and obey the divine instruction in the scriptures. He is to base his faith not on feeling, but upon the evidence and the word of God. 
Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 7, page 928. Look up, look up and let your faith continually increase. Let this faith guide you along the narrow path that leads through the gates of the city into the great beyond, the wide, unbounded future of glory that is for the redeemed. Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. The nations of the saved will know no other law than the law of heaven. All will be a happy, united family, clothed with the garments of praise and thanksgiving. Over the scene, the morning stars will sing together, and the sons of God will shout for joy, while God and Christ will unite in proclaiming, There shall be no more sin, neither shall there be any more death. Prophets and Kings, page 732. Jesus is soon coming. And our position should be that of waiting and watching for his appearing. We should not allow anything to come in between us and Jesus. We must learn here to sing the song of heaven, so that when our warfare is over, we can join in the song of the heavenly angels in the city of God. What is that song? It is praise and honor and glory unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. We shall meet opposition, we shall be hated of all men for Christ's sake, and by Satan, because he knows that there is with the followers of Christ a divine power which will undermine his influence. We cannot escape reproach. We should not allow our time to be so occupied with things of a temporal nature, or even with matters pertaining to the cause of God, that we shall pass on day after day without pressing close to the bleeding side of Jesus. We want to commune with him daily. We are exhorted to fight the good fight of faith. It will be a hard battle to maintain a life of earnest faith. But if we cast ourselves wholly upon Christ with a settled determination to cleave only to him, we shall be able to repulse the enemy and gain a glorious victory. Lift him up, page 372. Monday, March 20, Everlasting Life Let nothing lessen the force of the truth for this time. The present truth is to be our burden. The third angel's message must do its work of separating from the churches a people who will take their stand on the platform of eternal truth. Our message is a life and death message, and we must let it appear as it is, the great power of God. We are to present it in all its telling force. Then the Lord will make it effectual. It is our privilege to expect large things, even the demonstration of the Spirit of God. This is the power that will convict and convert the soul. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 6, page 61. As Christ's earthly ministry drew to a close, and he realized that he must soon leave his disciples to carry on the work without his personal supervision, he sought to encourage them and to prepare them for the future. He did not deceive them with false hopes. As an open book, he read what was to be. He knew he was about to be separated from them, to leave them as sheep among wolves. He knew that they would suffer persecution, that they would be cast out of the synagogues and would be thrown into prison. He knew that for witnessing to him as the Messiah, some of them would suffer death. And something of this he told them. In speaking of their future, he was plain and definite that in their coming trial, they might remember his words and be strengthened to believe in him as the Redeemer. He spoke to them also words of hope and courage. Let not your heart be troubled, he said. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whither I go ye know, and the way ye know. 
John chapter 14, verses 1 to 4. For your sake I came into the world, for you I have been working. When I go away, I shall still work earnestly for you. I came to the world to reveal myself to you that you might believe. I go to my Father and yours to cooperate with him in your behalf. The Acts of the Apostles, page 21. The leaders in Israel professed to understand the prophecies, but they had received false ideas in regard to the manner of Christ's coming. Satan had deceived them, and all the glories of Christ's second advent they applied to his first appearing. All the wonderful events clustering around his second coming they looked for at his first. Therefore, when he came, they were not prepared to receive him. Between the first and the second advent of Christ, a wonderful contrast will be seen. No human language can portray the scenes of the second coming of the Son of Man in the clouds of heaven. He is to come with his own glory and with the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. He will come clad in the robe of light which he has worn from the days of eternity. Lift him up, page 373. Tuesday, March 21, The New Jerusalem And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Revelation chapter 21, verse 2. There is the New Jerusalem, the metropolis of the glorified new earth a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. The tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Isaiah chapter 62 verse 3 and Revelation chapter 21 verse 3. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light. Revelation chapter 22 verse 5. The light of the sun will be superseded by a radiance which is not painfully dazzling, yet which immeasurably surpasses the brightness of our noontide. The glory of God and the Lamb floods the holy city with unfading light. The redeemed walk in the sunless glory of perpetual day. God's Amazing Grace Page 369. To his faithful followers, Christ has been a daily companion, a familiar friend. They have lived in close, constant communion with God. Upon them the glory of the Lord has risen. In them the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ has been reflected. Now they rejoice in the undimmed rays of the brightness and glory of the King in His Majesty. They are prepared for the communion of heaven, for they have heaven in their hearts. A little longer and we shall see the King in his beauty. A little longer and he will wipe all tears from our eyes. Then by innumerable voices will be sung the song, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he shall dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Revelation chapter 21, verse 3. God's Amazing Grace, page 358. While life is the inheritance of the righteous, death is the portion of the wicked. Moses declared to Israel, I have set before thee this day life and good, and death and evil. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 15. The death referred to in these scriptures is not that pronounced upon Adam, for all mankind suffer the penalty of his transgression. It is the second death that is placed in contrast with everlasting life. In consequence of Adam's sin, death passed upon the whole human race. All alike go down into the grave, and through the provisions of the plan of salvation, all are to be brought forth from their graves. There shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Acts chapter 24 verse 15 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 22. But a distinction is made between the two classes that are brought forth. All that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good 
unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29. They who have been accounted worthy of the resurrection of life are blessed and holy. On such the second death hath no power. Revelation chapter 20 verse 6. The Great Controversy, page 544. Wednesday, March 22. The Settling of Accounts. We claim to be Christians waiting for the second appearing of our Lord in the clouds of heaven. Then what shall we do with our time, our understanding, our possessions which are not ours, but are entrusted to us to test our honesty? Let us bring them to Jesus. Let us use our treasures for the advancement of His cause. Thus we shall obey the injunction, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. It has come to be understood that talents are given only to a certain favored class to the exclusion of others who, of course, are not called upon to share in the toils or rewards. But it is not so represented in the parable. When the master of the house called his servants, he gave to every man his work. The whole family of God are included in the responsibility of using their Lord's goods. Councils on Stewardship, pages 116 and 117. All, both high and low, rich and poor, have been trusted by the Master with talents, some more and some less, according to their several ability. The blessing of God will rest upon the earnest, loving, diligent workers. Their investment will be successful and will secure souls to the kingdom of God and for themselves an immortal treasure. All are moral agents and are entrusted with goods of heaven. The amount of talents is proportioned according to the capabilities possessed by each. God gives to every man his work, and he expects corresponding returns according to their various trusts. He does not require the increase from ten talents of the man to whom he has given only one talent. He does not expect the man of poverty to give alms as the man who has riches. He does not expect of the feeble and suffering the activity and strength which the healthy man has. The one talent used to the best account God will accept according to that a man hath and not according to that he hath not. What shall we answer? Review and Herald, February 23, 1886 God has lent us capital for investment. It is not our property, and we displease God if we hoard up or spend as we choose our Lord's goods. We are responsible for the use or abuse of that which God has thus lent us. If this capital which the Lord has placed in our hands lies dormant, or we bury it in the earth, be it only one talent, we shall be called to an account by the Master. He requires not ours, but His own with usury. Every talent which returns to the master will be scrutinized. The doings and trusts of God's servants will not be considered an unimportant matter. Every individual will be dealt with personally and will be required to give an account of the talents entrusted to him, whether he has improved or abused them. The reward bestowed will be proportionate to the talents improved. The punishment awarded will be according as the talents have been abused. Councils on Stewardship Page 119. Thursday, March 23. Eyes on the Prize. The Son of God was the heir of all things, and the dominion and glory of the kingdoms of this world were promised to him. Yet when he appeared in this world, it was without riches or splendor. The world understood not his union with the Father, the excellency and glory of his divine character were hid from them. He was therefore despised and rejected of men, and we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. 
Even as Christ was in the world, so are his followers. They are the sons of God and joint heirs with Christ, and the kingdom and dominion belong to them. The world understand not their character and holy calling. They perceive not their adoption into the family of God. Their union and fellowship with the Father and Son is not manifest, and while the world behold their humiliation and reproach, it does not appear what they are or what they shall be. They are strangers. The world know them not and appreciate not the motives which actuate them. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, page 286. He who has given his life to God in ministry to his children is linked with him who has all the resources of the universe at his command. His life is bound up by the golden chain of the immutable promises with the life of God. The Lord will not fail him in the hour of suffering and need. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 and in the hour of final need, the merciful shall find refuge in the mercy of the compassionate Savior and shall be received into everlasting habitations. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 24. Ransomed by the sacrifice of Christ, washed from sin in his blood and clothed in his righteousness, Paul has the witness in himself that his soul is precious in the sight of his Redeemer. His life is hid with Christ in God, and he is persuaded that he who has conquered death is able to keep that which is committed to his trust. His mind grasps the Savior's promise, I will raise him up at the last day. John chapter 6 verse 40. His thoughts and hopes are centered on the second coming of his Lord, and as the sword of the executioner descends and the shadows of death gather about the martyr, his latest thought springs forward, as will his earliest in the great awakening, to meet the life-giver who shall welcome him to the joy of the blessed. Well nigh a score of centuries have passed since Paul the aged poured out his blood as a witness for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. No faithful hand recorded for the generations to come the last scenes in the life of this holy man, but inspiration has preserved for us his dying testimony. Like a trumpet peal, his voice has rung out through all the ages since, nerving with his own courage thousands of witnesses for Christ and wakening in thousands of sorrow-stricken hearts the echo of his own triumphant joy. I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 512 and 513. For further reading, God's Amazing Grace, For Each Day's Need, page 177, and That I May Know Him, God's Treasure House of Supplies, page 224.